So we're in a sermon series talking about personal ministry because that's, that's our theme in, in the church this year, personal ministry. So we've already spoken about the idea of what we think personal ministry is. That's fulfilling the calling that God has in your life, in my life, in our lives to serve others in his name. And we spoke the first week, remember, about the fact that it's God calling us and how that makes all the difference. The Lord God, Almighty, creator of everything. It's the one who's calling us. And then we spoke a little bit about the idea about God's calling us. God's inviting us. It's an invitation for us to be able to join with God in the work, the ongoing work that is going on in his creation. And then last week we spoke a little bit about how this calling is in my life. It's in our lives, each of our lives. That we have a calling in us. There's a need in the world and a calling in our lives. And as those two things come together, the world's a better place. And I find fulfillment and meaning and purpose in my life. It's part of the intelligent design of the way the world was put together. This week now we're going to emphasize and think about, and this is the conclusion of this particular sermon series, what it means to serve, to serve others. And Peter gives us a rather unique definition of service in his letter to the early Christians in the fourth chapter, verse 10. He says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. What an awesome definition of what serving means. Now, being a servant of God, that's a biblical description of who Moses was, who were the judges, the prophets, the people of Israel themselves, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it is a great description of who we are as the church, me and you, the church. We're members of Christ's body, Christ the servant of God. As members of that body, we are each servants of God, serving others, not ourselves. It's been said that the church is one of the few organizations that exist for those who are not part of the organization. Yeah, serving others. Members of Christ's body, serving others through the church. In fact, that's the only way members of Christ's body can really, can really serve. It's through the church. Because there are many members in the church, and we, and we can accomplish so much more with many members working together. We learned that. We saw that last week. Now, a servant is one who will order his or her life around the master's wishes. Jesus is our master. Paul says Christ is the head of the body, master of the body. And here's the truth in each one of our lives. Each body member, it's me and you, is connected to and takes direction from the head. So what that means is that what an individual thinks really isn't all that important because the body is to be unified through the head, each body member taking its direction from the head. And a servant is willing to sacrifice, to adjust, to prioritize his or her efforts based upon the requests of the head. That's why a body can be coordinated in its efforts and each member doing its part to achieve what needs to be done. Jesus called his disciples together and he said, 
you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Now, the issue of servanthood ultimately comes down to obedience. We are called to serve. So first, will we hear, do we hear the call? And second, when we hear the call, will we obey or not? Will we answer or not? Will we respond or not? Because we either live in obedience or disobedience. We either live in accordance with God's will, word, and way, or we live in rebellion of God's will, word, and way. We're either in submission or we're in subversion in our lives. God tells us through Paul that even Christ, in his human form, had to learn obedience to be a servant. He says to the Philippians, but he made himself, meaning Christ, nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The writers to the Hebrews says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. And although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Obedience leads us to joy and fulfillment in our lives. And disobedience brings persistent discomfort of heart, soul, and mind. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. And my Father will honor the one who serves me. So servanthood becomes the backbone of discipleship. You know, the image that God uses for the people of the world is a field that's ripe for harvest. And the need is for servants, for harvesters. That's us. The church, you and me, we are supposed to reap the harvest. Some of you know that Bob and Teresa have heard and responded to a call in their lives. So I've asked Bob to come up here and share with us some of his call experience in order to help encourage us all to fulfill God's calling. Bob? Man, um, me and like a lot of others, I'm not real comfortable speaking in front of groups, so could I have a little prayer here first? Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit put forth these words out of my mouth, Father, and bring me the peace and give me the peace that I need to speak, speak your words. And Father, give those with ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to them. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Um, God truly has a sense of humor, man. Oh, sorry. Two weeks ago, I volunteered to give a uh, 
video testimony, 90 seconds. I got in with Mark. I said what I said. I said, how was that? He said, that was 45 seconds, Bob. So, so then I had to, uh, then Aaron asked me two weeks later to come up here and speak for 10 minutes. I'm like, oh God, you truly do have a sense of humor. <laughs> so um, when I was asked to do personal ministry and speak on this, it kind of took, that's the what. So I kind of came back to why. And uh, it's funny how God works, just like this whole service today. He is good in, in, the, in the obedience and everything. God just puts it all together for you. And I, and I got to thinking that for 52 years of my life, prior to coming to Christ, I was borrowing my faith. And borrowing my faith being what my parents had told me, what the church had told me I was supposed to do, what everybody told me. I mean, I believed there was a God, but I didn't believe it for myself, nor did I act upon it for myself. I didn't do anything. All I did was believe it. And not until six years ago did I actually come to the Lord, where I, where I needed him. I came to the end of myself, and I needed him. So in that, and in the comfort of my own home now, the Lord lit me up, and I'm all excited, man. I was like, Teresa, man, do you realize? And I'm just talking and talking and talking, and it's coming out. And I want to do this. I want to do that. And really, she was like, Bob, shut up. We need to go to sleep, you know? <laughs> well, there was a John Hagee ministry. It was on uh, Revelation in Orlando. So we go down there. First night, it was awesome, man, and I got my spirit was all fired up. So the second night, we're in there, and the Lord told me, and it's probably about the distance between here and that wall, it was empty between me and this man that was about that far away from me. And the Lord told me to go up, lay hands on this man, and pray for him. And I'm like, what? Why do you want me to go? I don't even know this guy. I don't know anything, but yet here two weeks ago, I'm on fire. You know, I'm ready to go. So I didn't do it. So I just kind of, and it bothered me a little bit. I mean, I talked to Teresa about it, and it's like, you know, if that guy's there tomorrow night, I'm going to do this. Well, of course, the guy wasn't there. Then the Lord spoke to me again about somebody here in this church to go and pray with him. Again, I didn't do it. So, I mean, I'm talking to Teresa about it, and I'm like, man, this is starting to get to me here. God's telling me to do stuff, but I'm not doing it. So one day, I'm up here, and Ray Hughes is here. And he was getting ready to go deliver Meals on Wheels. So I said, hey, can I ride with you? He said, yeah, Linda's not here, so come on, you just ride with me. I said, all right. So we get to uh, Elijah's house, the last stop. And uh, so we're in there. The guy is a very godly man. So we leave the house, and I said, man, that was kind of strange, Ray. He said, what's that? I said, man, the Lord told me to paint the guy's roof. And Ray says, yeah, he told me to give him a car. So... <laughs> I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm not giving him my car. I said, well, I'm going to paint the roof, okay? This is like my third time, but this is easy for me. See, this is something I can do, something I'm, I'm comfortable with, painting something. I'm comfortable with it. So I talked to Paul. Paul calls him, and it's all good. So this Saturday now, I'm going out there to do the guy's roof. Saturday morning, I'm up. We're drinking a coffee, and I'm talking with Teresa. Well, there was a preacher on television, and he spoke of healing. And in his little talk, all of a sudden, man, it's like I just saw a little video in front of me. It was God speaking to me again about praying for this man for his cancer. So now I'm talking to Teresa. I said, man, this is weird. I said, this again, I told her what happened. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to do it this time. You know what I mean? I got to, Teresa. I said, this is bothering me, man. Here twice I haven't done anything. So I get to his house. He comes out. Hey, Bob, how are you? We just had met. We've only met once for 10 minutes. And so it's, hey, how are you? I'm doing good. So I said, man, the funny thing, I said, the Lord spoke to me this morning about you. He said, yeah, what did he tell you? I said, he told me to tell you to trust him for your healing on your cancer. And man, he lit up. He said, that's just what I was praying for before you got here. And I'm like, whoa. I said, okay, well, let's go ahead, you know. So I laid hands on him, and I prayed for him. And he looked at me and said, man, I already feel different, Bob. He said, something feels different. I said, okay. So we're talking a little bit. And out of the background, his grandson, which is, I think, eight, was learning to play the keyboards. 
And all of a sudden, he starts playing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. And if any of you know that song, it's Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary for you. Now, this is what I was asking for before, and now I've done it. Well, in doing that with Elijah and getting the confirmation that I got, not only from him, but from the song, from God, from everything, that made me start thinking backwards. What were those other two people that I didn't do? What were they praying for? And did God let them down in their own minds because I let them down? That got to be a, just a burden on me. So after that, and I talked to Teresa about it, and I mean, I told her what happened with Elijah and all that, and I don't know if all y'all know, but Teresa's in Bible college now. So both of us are on fire to go do stuff for the Lord, and we just want to. So when we're called to do something, we're going to go do it. And the one thing that I have found is if it's in my comfort zone, like painting the guy's roof, that's easy for me. It's within my comfort zone. I don't feel... But if I'm called to go out and in public where people might think funny of you or whatever, then I've always kind of shied back away from that because I'm wondering and worried about what others might think or say. But through all of this now, I'm really only worried about one thing. One, I've had three heart attacks. If everybody don't know, I've had three heart attacks and I've already died once. I had my little death experience. It was awesome. And... Uh, Oh, it was awesome, awesome, awesome. But um, and now I'm only worried about one, what he says. That's on the day that I do leave this earth. What's he going to say? Either good and well done, my faithful servant, or Bob, you were a decent little sheep. I'm okay with both of those. But if that get away from me, I didn't know you, man, woo, that's one I don't want to hear. So I'm going to do what I'm told to do. Um. That's John. Um, on the, uh, oh, there was a third too. I'm up here with the, uh, one of the teachers here in the, in the um, daycare. Cole is her name. She's the um, after school and the summer camp. She leads the summer camp in the after school. And one day the Lord told me to go pray for her, for her son. So I asked her, I said, would you like me to pray for you? Because she was up there and she was all worried about her son. I don't know if, any, if you don't know her son. Her son was having a real hard time. He had been in and out of the hospital, emergency room style, more times before he was two years old than any of us have ever been. And he's, I mean, every time he got a fever, he would go into convulsions, seizures, everything. Well, after I got up there and we prayed, man, I felt a throbbing in my hands that was just my pulsating on her, and I didn't know if she felt it. I thought it was just me. But after we got through praying, I looked at her. I said, did you feel that? She said, yeah, I felt that. I said, man, that was kind of strange. But three weeks later, her son is now in a, in a class where he's almost one-on-one. -on -one. His speech has improved. He's had no, um, no, no seizure since, nothing. So I know when we answer God's call and we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, God does what he's supposed to be doing, always. All right, and I'm going to get back to the, uh, oh, but last night. Yeah, well, last night when I was thinking of this and praying about it, the Lord put another person on my heart. It's, and it's actually, it's not my sister-in-law, but it's my sister-in-law's daughter. She's also got cancer. And she's in bad, bad spot. And she did chemo. But the chemo made her so sick. She's got four kids, four little guys. Made her so sick she quit doing it, and she's trusting on God for it. And God laid it on my heart last night for me to go pray for. So that I will be doing. Um, let's get back to, now I'm back up to the present here with my friend's house. About four years ago, God called me. And just when I walked outside after Aaron had preached on, it was fresh water, newborns, and something else. I can't remember the other two. But as we walked outside, or as I walked outside, man, I just saw a picture of everything. I just saw it. And I spoke of it, and I, and I told everybody about it. Well, it wasn't, the timing wasn't right. It was, it was just kind of tabled, and it was done. And then, what, I don't know, a year and a half later, Michael Knapp was hired. Michael had a similar vision. Michael got that um, Airstream out there and bought the Airstream. He had all this 
he had the similar vision, so he's out there working on the Airstream. And because it was part of my vision also, I was real happy to help him do it. So I'm out there working with him all the time. Well, then now Michael's gone. The Airstream's still sitting there. So now it's back on me again. It's like, man, it's back on my heart. Let me go out here. And I spoke with Aaron about it, told him. I said, you know what? You know, let's go for it. He said, but we can't do it this year, which was last year, which we only had about a month. I said, why not? Why not? Let's go. You know, let's do it. So I honestly did it. And uh, in, the, uh, in Matthew, it's 1344. Parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. He, in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything that he owned to get enough money to buy the field. And the footnote was what really got me here. In his excitement, those who discover the kingdom find greater joy in it than can be found in any temporal, pre temporal pleasure. So it's like that out there. Man, I see a gem. Uh, one person has already accepted Christ out there. Terry, she's now a member of the church. She comes faithfully. She brings her children. Her children are so excited now. They didn't know Christ. They had no, no interaction with Christ, had no relationship, nothing, or even with church people. She is so excited that, and it just, it's kind of, it reminds me of, say, like going out and buying a new car. You go out and buy a new car, and that new car smell, and that new car, and it's awesome. Until about six months later, when it's not new anymore, now it's an old car. You know, not old, but I mean, it's the excitement, the joy is gone for you. But when somebody experiences, and, and you get the privilege to be able to be a part of that person's salvation, and you see them, I don't care what kind of a bad day you're having, when you see them, whew, that joy comes right back to you. It's just like the new car smell again. Boy, it's like, you know what? You are coming. You're safe. You had a part. And uh, out there in that field, we're all summer. So basically what it ends up for Teresa and I is we actually work seven days a week because we're out there on the weekends. So five days a week we do our normal. The weekends we're out there. And last year, I think it was for what? June, July. So June, July, and August to so three months, 12 weeks. And you know, her and I, the first time, had to keep pumping each other up. If I was getting down and getting tired, she'd have to say, oh, no, Bob, you signed on for this. So she'd pump me up. If she started getting down, I'd have to keep her pumped up. But when each time a family came out there with children or whatever, it was just the Holy Spirit would pump us up. So we didn't have a problem. So, and speaking of that, if any of you, and Dave, he could attest to it, there's several families that have come out there. Like Dave comes out there now to help me break it all down. Brings his son, and he's, his, his response was, man, this is a lot of fun. I thought it was gonna be hard work, but it's not even hard work. No, nothing's hard. When we as a group, Many hands make of light work. It's just what it is. And you enjoy yourself and your fellowship and you're having a good time doing it. It's not even work anymore. And especially, in my opinion, for the kingdom. And that, uh, it's funny, the, the gentle, I, I, I just thinking about, this morning God put it on me too, about just us as Gentiles. How did we get included into the family of God? Well, of the Jewish people's disobedience. Because they weren't listening, he included us. So we got included because of disobedience. So what do we need to do? Be obedient, okay? I mean, that's it. It's humble obedience and the rely, reliance on God is our true security in the Lord. And that's it.